This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we hear from award-winning journalist and anchor of NPR's Latino USA, Maria Inojosa, about her new book. It's called Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. In the book, Maria shared stories of her life growing up in a Mexican-American family in Chicago's South Side, and she tells us how her and her family's immigrant experiences shaped the stories she reported on for decades for media like NPR, CNN, and PBS. For much of her career, she's focused on people, especially Latinos, who've been affected by American policies. It's her memoir, but it's also a history lesson about our country's immigration system and the people who continue to suffer because of it. I want to welcome Maria Inahosa to our show. She's joining us via Zoom today. Maria, it's such a pleasure to talk with you today. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy to be here with you. I love your show. Oh, and as you, you know, <clears throat> even though I live in Harlem, New York City, I have a very strong love and affinity for Connecticut. <laughs> so hello, hello, hello. That's right. You come here to relax and to get away from <clears throat> the city. It is, um, it is our escape, our teeny teeny tiny little cottage is named Boca Chica (laughs) which is um, if there are any Dominicans listening they're going to be like what because it's very (laughs) funny we'll be in New York and we're like vamos a Boca Chica este fin de semana we're going to go to Boca Chica this weekend and um, for us it means Connecticut for everybody else they're looking at like you're going to the Dominican Republic it's like (laughs) no I'm just going to go swim in a lake Um, and that's what I do I swim and I disconnect and I look at birds Mm -hmm. And I love it. So thank you to Connecticut. Oh, you have saved my life multiple times. We love to hear that you have a a Connecticut tie. Now, Maria, our listeners know you're president and founder of Futuro Media. It's a nonprofit media organization. Connecticut public listeners can hear you hosting Latino USA Saturday evenings at 6. You also co-anchor In the Thick political podcast. And now you have this memoir out. I have to tell you, I couldn't put the book down. It really inspired me, but your career has been inspiring to so many of us. And we're going to talk about uh, this book for the full hour. So I'm excited to have this time with you. And I was amazed at how personal you got because you talk about things that uh, for women uh, and our careers, we, we struggle with balancing our careers with our family. At times we feel we, we feel this imposter syndrome. You talk about that in your book. You talk about your failures and also trauma that you've experienced. Can I ask when you decided now is time to put this in a book, to, to sit down and tell people who followed you for years about your life? So there's a, like every book, there's a story behind the book. And the story goes that um, I was on MSNBC one night, uh, close to the election. And I had a moment where I um, corrected uh, somebody who's a Trump supporter who used the term illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. And then he said, those illegals. And I said, you know, there's no such thing as an illegal human being. Illegal is not a noun. Um, you know, the first thing that the Nazis did was to declare the Jews to be an illegal people. And this was told to me by a survivor of Auschwitz, uh, Elie Wiesel, who I met and who I asked about the term illegal. I said, it doesn't sound right. He said, never use the term illegal to refer to a human being. They may have crossed illegally. They may be living illegally in the United States. Or without papers, but they are not an illegal person. So anyway, that happened and it went viral. It went viral and like 10, who knows how many million people saw it. And <clears throat> there was a sense of like, well, you know what? My um, chair of the board of directors of my nonprofit, who's a dear friend, said, why don't you write the book Illegal is Not an Out? And I was like, oh, I can do that. I'll write a little pocket book. It'll be short and sweet because I know what it takes to write a book. It's really hard. It's a lot of hard work and you have to disconnect from everything. And I, I have, you know, I I like to joke, I'm a Mexican immigrant. I've got 16 jobs. I can't, I can't disconnect from them. So a problem is, is that the publishing world was kind of like, um, because I, I mean, I had to find an agent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted the book to be published uh, widely and, you know, there was just like, no, that not an appetite for that kind of a book, a short little pocket book that we would pick up in the airport, you know, back when we used to fly mm-hmm. in airports and stuff like that. So um, I like to 
I like to talk about the, not the failures, but the ups and downs of things because everybody thinks like, oh my God, it's so great. You wrote a book. Look, all of my initial book proposals were rejected. They were rejected. And so I, I need people to understand like all of those Hollywood actors out there who you think are, they're, they're going through ups and downs. They're not getting all the roles. And those of us in the media, we're not getting all the shots. We got a lot of shots. We're not getting them all. So I like to say that. And I went back to the drawing board and worked really hard with my agent, Adriana Dominguez. And then we really flushed out this, um, uh, this idea. Um, and to be honest, we had early conversations when, with John Carp, who is the, uh, now the publisher and CEO of Simon & Schuster when he was the editor in chief. And, um, and we talked about the book being bigger being, being a bigger book. And I was kind of like, a big book. What's a, what's a big book? He's like a, a book that's like a thoughtful book. So it's not, yes, your life is great, all good, but you know, it's, you know, a little bit much. Right. And that was where the idea was born. And I'm so thankful because then we connected with Michelle Herrera Mulligan, uh, Irish Mexican American from Chicago. So we get each other and she really helped me to finesse this this idea of it's your life, but it's your life as through journalism, through your stories and through living through journalism, consuming it in the mm. 70s. You know, it's your life as a woman, as a survivor of, of rape. I didn't know that that was going to become part of the book, but it, it did. Mm. It's your life as um, as uh, somebody who's running a company. It's your life as an immigrant. And therefore, we're going to talk about immigration history because I need to, I too needed to understand, like, what the hell here? Mm -hmm. How come, how come I live near the Statue of Liberty that says, you know, we love you, but all of the policies, by the way, sadly, this was hard, <laughs> a hard pill, but it is the truth. Both Republicans and Democrats, a pox on both of their houses regarding immigration policy. And I needed to understand this almost like this was a love letter to my country my adopted country, almost like this was a reckoning uh, of myself with my adopted country of the United States, where I am a proud citizen. Um, and that's how the book was born. And I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that that we got those rejections. It, it should have been a little book because this is a big mm -hmm. issue that impacts all of us. The book is Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. Our listeners can go to WMPR.org slash where we live to read an excerpt. Maria Inahosa with us uh, for the hour. I loved reading about you growing up in Chicago's South Side. Again, uh, you and your family came here from Mexico. Uh, your father got a job uh, working uh, as a faculty member and there was this moment in the in the book where you talk about discovering public radio for the first time. You were uh, in your bedroom uh, one one day. Tell us about that, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you asked this question. <laughs> oh my god, this is like one of my favorite moments because, um, in fact, it's so adorable. I actually bought recently a little tiny radio, and it has a dial that you dial and that radio lives with me in Connecticut with our family and my kids watch me as I'm you know flipping through the dial actually on a little radio in my time in Connecticut and so this is the scene the scene is that I'm you know in my early teens and I'm in my bedroom in the back alone um, I was the youngest of four so you know, a lot was going on. It wasn't like I had a lot of, you know, there was not helicopter parenting at all. I, I was, you know, an independent young woman. And I'm in the back room in my bedroom and I'm flipping through the dial on our little plastic radio that had been in the house, Jesus, since the 1960s. <laughs> we just never, you know, we're immigrants. We never threw anything out. And um, and then I'm just like, you know, to the creak, the scratchy. And then all of a sudden it was like, a voice that said, and it was a man, and was a man's voice, mm. uh, and it said something like, "In Latin America today, the survivors of the 1973 coup against Salvador Allende uh, have been talking about the beginning of something they call the Dirty War. We went to the streets of Chile, and we wanted to hear from the people there. And then you would hear like, no, es que nos parece." And so, uh, 
you know, and then they'd be like, and in Mexico, um, you know, a development in the conversation around uh, the Catholic Church and its inroads into preventing human rights abuses, blah. And I was like, what is this? What? What is? I mean, my my head exploded because radio back then, and you know, a lot of it now it's commercial radio, which is like fun as a teenager. You know, it's it's totally fun growing up with radio as an American teenager and how you, you know, how you move from station to station, from teeny bop station, you know, to soul, to R&B, to alternative rock, to, you know, whatever. It, it was like fun. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't this. It wasn't somebody talking. And then it was them talking about Latin America. And I actually had heard, this is the, the a beautiful thing that was revealed to me in, in the book, in the writing of the book. I was like, no, you heard public radio first in Mexico. That's where you heard public mm-hmm. radio because there is a long tradition of public media in certain countries in Latin America, Mexico being one of them. So Radio, radio Educación, which means radio education or education radio, Radio Educación is Radio Pública or uh, Canal 11, Channel 11, um, was public television. And so I had heard women and men in Radio Pública saying like this, you know, in Radio Universidad, este, which was a university radio, they would talk this way. And so it, it, it was like the, you know, like that moment with the Reese's peanut butter cup, you know, that just like, <laughs> and I was like, whoa, there's public media that exists in English and they're talking about Latin America and I'm learning something. They're not yelling at me and I don't have to listen. And by the way, I'm a big mus- music lover of all sorts, but I was like, I, they're talking to me. They're not yelling at me. And it wasn't, by the way, that was not the moment when I said, oh my God, this is what I want to do with my life because <laughs> there were there were no people like me doing that kind of radio. Mm-hmm. It was more just like it existed. Mm-hmm. You would go on to have a, a fairly popular radio show in college and you were very focused on Latin American issues. Uh, that focus, that reporting is what helped you get your first job at NPR Weekend Edition. You talk about that. What was it like to be the first Latina there working as a journalist, Maria? <laughs> at NPR, it's so funny that um, that I've gotten this question a lot, especially from you know Latina journalists now who are in the business, in the mainstream. Thank, thank God that they're there. But they, they do all ask me like, oh my God, you were the first? Like, like really the first, the first? And it's like, yeah. And it's, what was it like? And I was like, well, to be honest with you, I was happy I had a job. You know, I waited tables. I was a waitress. That's what I did. Even when I was a freelance beginning journalist um, at the NPR Bureau here in New York, I would go there during the day and at night I would wait tables. And I remember there's a, a part of the book where I write about waiting tables. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who remembers a place called Carumba in New York. And that's the way it was called, Carumba, which is in Mexican Spanish is Caramba, which, you know, it's kind of, it's like, uh, wow. So the restaurant, it was like the first big Tex-Mex restaurant. Well, I worked there um, in the evenings and I was so ashamed if any of my NPR colleagues, Mike Schuster came in to eat there. Mm was a longtime NPR correspondent. Margot Adler, may she rest in peace. Love Margot Adler. She came in to eat there and I was like, please don't let them see me. Um, so I, I had a job. I was happy and yes, it was weird. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could tell everybody. I mean, there, of course you were being looked at. <laughs> you know, there was no, there was no, so you were like, okay, but, and that kind of helped me to understand, like, look, your uniqueness in this situation is something that you have to own. It becomes your superpower. Um, you know, that's when I define myself as Maria Hinojosa and not as Maria Hinojosa, uh, who I was, by the way, and people can call me Maria Hinojosa and I'm fine with it. But for me, I was Maria Hinojosa and I understood privilege. Mm. My dad May he rest in peace. He was a medical doctor dedicated to research, frankly, a genius. He helped to create the cochlear implant. Um, And 
you know, we were not wealthy at all, but he, he was a professional. And I got to go to the University of Chicago High School. And then I got to Barnard here in New York City. And when I got to NPR, I was like, well, yeah, you're scared and you feel out of sorts and you're the only one who's kind of dressing up because, you know, I'm Latina. So I, I, it was all about my fashion. I mean, I had my six inch heels because I'm five feet tall. <laughs> so I always wear heels. Um, you know, I had my, my, my look, you know, I mean, I, I, I had a look. Um, I stood out. And then I would force myself to raise my hand mm. in the editorial meetings. I, I would push, you know, take one, my left arm, and just push up my right arm <clears throat> and force my hand to go up. And I would force myself <laughs> because I was so scared and I just didn't want to be rejected. And I was, and I said, you have privilege. Therefore, you have responsibility. Mm. Speak up. Mm. Speak up. Own your voice. Do it, do it for everybody. Do it, mm -hmm. you know, come on, you got this. But there were those moments where you felt out of place and you didn't have that confidence that we, we know you to have these days, uh, Maria. I wanted to read this quote from the book uh, when uh, Jay Kernis, who was the Morning Edition creator, when you were first hired to work on Weekend Edition with Scott Simon, and he said to you, I've never met a Latina, Ivy Leaguer, radio producer, international traveler who loves theater, speaks two languages, and it is so politically aware. I doubt there are any more there like you. When you look back and you think about when he said that to you, you know, what was your reaction, Maria? <laughs> I, I looked at him and I said, of course there are. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of us. And he was like, well, I want to hire you right now. And I was like, all right, all right. And then soon afterwards, I mean, Jay and I, by the way, are colleagues. We work together. He's a producer at CBS Sunday Morning. He has produced me for that show. Um, and I love Jay. And we're very honest with each other. Um, and I think that that's all we ask really is honesty. Um, and so I said to him, I said, of course there are a lot. And he said, well, let's, let's, the next time. And Cecilia Weissman, may she rest in peace, my best friend from Barnard. Um, she was the next one hired by all things considered. They asked, you know, or Jay said, hey, you hire this other fabulous Latina woman. She's amazing. Um, and so Cecilia was the first Latina uh, to work on all things considered, which really is a, a huge deal. And, um, and and so, you know, I think that's important, like the honesty of the, the moment. Jay was being really honest because he had never met anybody like me. And by the way, Jay is the creator of Morning Edition. So mm -hmm. he's, you know, a, a brilliant uh, uh, journalistic media mind. Um, but he was honest. He was like, wow, I've never met anybody like you there. I mean, are there, are, I mean, this must be like the only one. I was like, come on. And he didn't take it badly. And in fact, as I said, we became close. Um, and that's, as I said, what we want is just like an honest conversation. Mm -hmm. I was thinking to the newsrooms I started working in uh, in the early uh, 2000s, and I was one, if not the only, uh, woman of color journalist in a newsroom of uh, many white men. And even today, Maria, in 2020, newsrooms around our country, especially in public radio, are being uh, held accountable. Why there are not more journalists of color working in these newsrooms? When you think about what you went through in the 80s and how this is still an issue today. <laughs> it makes me crazy. It makes me crazy because... Some, somewhere along the line, our fellow journalists who are, are white and often male um, got this idea that this was some kind of a political argument. You know, that the conversation about really thorough, deep um, representation, quote unquote, diversity, uh, equity, um, was somehow a, a highly politicized conversation. I mean, I was accused of being too political. This was one of the things I was, you know, to be a so-called rabble rouser because you want to bring more diverse voices into public media. You know, that's not radical. That's not rabble rousing. That's not political. It's actually, one, doing the best journalism that we can. And two, it's actually the smartest market decisions that you can make. Because the more representative you are in your media, the more audience you're going to have. The more audience you have, the better it is all across. One, 
I believe journalism is is a mission. I, I that's why I have a nonprofit media company because I don't believe that this is about making money. But okay, if it's about making money, well, reach the market. Understand that your market is diverse, and I just. I just don't understand how you wouldn't want a newsroom where you can get the most kind of opinions. That's what our newsroom looks like. And we're always trying to increase, like we are, my newsroom, Futuro Media, that produces Latino USA in the thick, uh, the politics podcast, we, and, and more, we are diverse, including white men, by the way, mm-hmm. but, but we're always thinking how we can do better. So this is incredibly frustrating to me. Um, I have to say, even now, as we get closer to the election, uh, there's a real conversation among Latinos and Latinas about a kind of erasure of Latinos and Latinas um, leading up to the election, which is really crazy because this group is really the most targeted and kind of focused on by at least one part of, of, of this um, presidential campaign, and that would be the Trump administration, that their entire argument is to build a wall because caravans of uh, sick contaminated uh you know people who want to trample over your country and make you all speak spanish um are 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 going to take over and it's just like what are you what are you talking about um so the fact that there are not more latinos across the board in media mm-hmm. and i mean much more like not one or two you know what is this that there are no latinos in the presidential debates kiss eso mm. How is that possible? You know, Latinos, apart from white voters, and it's okay, these terms are, uh, but Latinos are the second largest voting bloc, 32 million potential voters, larger than the African-American voting bloc. You would not know that from the media coverage, from the conversations, from the ways in which the policies that this administration has used are in fact um, uh, attacking these communities. I mean, what is this contradiction that we're celebrating essential workers, that essential workers are all the food workers, many of whom we know are undocumented. No no surprise. Okay. We we know this. And yet none of those food workers get any access to any of the benefits from COVID, uh, from the COVID uh, pandemic, Mm -hmm. you know, economic response. None. What is that? How, how can you how can you treat a people that you are saying are essential? How can you treat them like this? Which is why um, last week when I was on um, another public radio, network, well, you know, WNYC sister <laughs> sister in New York, and I was saying to my fellow New Yorkers, when you see Latinos and Latinas in your in your community, say thank you to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was doing when I was you know, finally able to walk out and go up to Broadway and I would see my paisanos and paisanas working in the grocery. Gracias, paisano. Oyeme, gracias por tu trabajo. Thank you for your work, paisano. Mm-hmm. Paisana, thank you. I would see the nannies still during the pandemic with children that they're caring for. Gracias, señora, por su trabajo. Mm-hmm. The, the pizza men who were delivering all of the food that New Yorkers were eating. Thank you. So, by the way, my father was a medical doctor. He was not delivering pizza. So please do not think that all Latinos deliver pizza. We do. We're proud. We're proud to be, you know, serving food, cooking food. But that's not all what we do. You know, we do many, many other things, too. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, this is where it gets really frustrating, the lack of diversity. Because if we had more Latinos and Latinas in the media across the board, I don't think we would have gotten to this point where we are. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today, Maria Hinojosa, talking about her new memoir, Once I Was You. She's president and founder of Futuro Media. She's host of NPR's Latina USA, co-anchor of In the Thick Political Podcast. We're going to talk more about her book, about her life, her career, and about the people that she's covered for more than 30 years, right after this break.
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is journalist Maria Hinojosa, whose memoir came out just days ago in the opening pages of Once I Was You. Maria takes readers to the moment inside the McAllen Airport, nine miles from the Texas-Mexico border, when she sees a little girl looking not at her, but through her. Maria, tell us about her. Who was this little girl? You know, I have a dream that one day I'll I'll actually get to know who she is. I, I have a dream that this little girl who was in an airport, um, just sitting there, actually, as you said, looking through me, will read this book one day and get in touch with me. That's my dream. The scene is, is a scene that, um, you know, if people back when we were flying on planes, people might rec- recollect seeing a group of kids all wearing badly fitted sweatsuits, sweatsuits um, sitting in an airport. Now, usually in an airport, it was seven o'clock in the morning. It was early. It was in McAllen Airport. Usually kids in an airport are happy. They're jumping around. They're playing with their brothers and sisters or with their school group, whatever. This little girl was sitting there not moving at all. And that's when we, our eyes locked. And I, I was like, wow, wait a second, what's going on? And then I zoomed out and I was like, oh my God, this is one of the little girls. Oh my God, this is happening right here in front of my eyes. Oh my God. And I went and I very calmly, because I understood that they were being chaperoned and that these children, the definition of being trafficked, one of the definitions is that you are told not to speak to anybody. I know that these children have been told not to speak to anybody, that their chaperones are watching them like hawks. I don't know if I want to call them chaperones. They're really traffickers and kidnappers. And I know that those are very, very strong words, but these children do not know where they are, who they are with. They don't have a hold of their passports or their identification, and they're told not to talk to anyone. That's the definition of trafficking. So I went and I calmly sat next to her. There was an empty seat. And I just started talking to her, could barely hear her. Um, And then that's, that's the opening session section of my book. Um, That's not how I started writing it. I started writing it through my mother's story of, you know, and my father's story of leaving Mexico and moving to Chicago. But when I went back to write the introduction, this was a story that as Sandra Cisneros, my muse and the great American writer, she always said, write about the stories, not the ones that you remember, but the ones that you wish you could forget or the one that you've buried so hard, you know. And this is one of the ones that, uh, so, you know, I ended up engaging with the people who were moving, transporting these children. Um, and they were, they were all of these kids. It was about, I can't remember how many, uh, under a dozen. There was a little boy who was like five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, this is still happening. I mean, right now, who knows, because I haven't been down to the border since last time I was there, it was in January. So who knows exactly what is happening now? There's a total halt uh, to immigration um, because so-called because of COVID. But really, it was this administration's attempt forever to want to close down, shut Mm -hmm. down all immigration, including refugees and asylum. So Uh, so that is that is the mm -hmm. opening. It's It's a letter to this little girl who I hope wherever she is. Oh my God, please. Maybe she'll remember and she'll find me. And this was in February of 2019. So again, uh, she and these other children, they were the children that were being separated from their parents or maybe who'd come across the border on their own uh, under the Trump administration. And you didn't know where they were headed, but there were, as you said, chaperones uh, with them. And you said something to her. Tell us what you told her. Well, to her... Well, to her in specific, I I asked, I was just to be clear, I was like, so where were you? Were you in a big, big, big house? If you remember, these children were being housed in a a converted Walmart. Um, And so I wanted to understand if she was in that big box cage, and she was. Um, When I tried to speak to to the kids, now that they had been, you know, they were standing up, they were getting onto a plane, United Airlines, by the way. Um, And so the flight attendants... They know what's going on. No one's saying anything. The pilots know what's going on. 
the airlines know what's going on and no one's saying anything. Um, so I, when I was told by these people who were moving these kids, they, I, they no, you can't speak to them. Then I just, <laughs> I, um, I started saying out loud in Spanish and I started speaking to them, but I was speaking to the, you know, the people who were transporting these kids. And I said in Spanish, um, and I'll say that for a moment here. I was like, es que ellos, estos niños tienen el derecho de hablar con una periodista si, si quieren. Ellos ellos tienen el derecho de saber que hay gente aquí que está preocupado por ellos. So I was, you know, I was saying to the kids so they could hear me, the, these children have the right to speak to a journalist. These children have the right to know that there are people who want to know how they are, that these children know that they are, that there are people who want them here to be taken care of, uh, that we want them safe, that we care about them and that they are not the problem. And I said all of this. And, and then I said, yeah, it was pretty emotional. I, I, um, I just said, I said all of this out loud to this little girl because um, I wanted her to, to see me um, because I was seeing her. Because, you know, I said, I see you because once I was you. And by the way, we did not have a title for this book up until the very end. It was getting a little scary. Let me tell you, Lucy, we did not have a title. It was a scary thing. There are many scary things that happen when you write a book. Um, and then we had somebody else come in and read it. They were like, and, and I was like, okay, let's go. And I, I really, really love this title. You said that you saw yourself and her uh, there's a part in your book where you talk about when your mother flew you as a baby uh, from Mexico to Chicago to meet up with your father again, who got a job um, as a faculty member. Can you read that excerpt for us on page 11? What happened uh, to your mother when she tried uh, to to uh, walk through uh, immigration? Right. So we had flown f by plane from Mexico City to Dallas. We were doing immigration in Dallas, and then we were going to fly on to meet my dad um, in Chicago. Um, and, um, and the immigration agent basically, um, begins to, it's, it's, it's my sister, my brothers, mm -hmm. myself, I'm a toddler in her arms and my mother who was petite, five feet tall. And the immigration agent was super tall, very Texan. So forgive me, I'm going to imitate a Texas accent. Mm -hmm. Please don't get offended. Um, <clears throat> he says, ma'am. Your baby looks like she has the German measles, he said in a thick Texas accent, which is contagious. So we're going to have to put her in quarantine. The rest of you are okay to come in with your green cards, but the little baby, we're going to have to put her in quarantine and keep her. For my mom, those two words sent her reeling. Keep her. Her knees almost buckled, and she felt the urge to run away as fast as she could. How could she be feeling both impulses at once? She had to force herself to take control of the situation. This man wanted to, to take away her chicle, her gum. Mm. Berta had never before been told that someone was going to keep one of her children. Her heart was beating so fast it felt like she had a hummingbird in her chest. She wanted to unleash a blood-curling scream right then and there. It felt like someone had just sliced her open, reached in, and tried to rip out her heart like in one of those sacrifices de los Aztecas. Berta took a deep breath. Calmate, she told herself, while at the same time she instinctively looked around for her allies and saw that she had no one to come to her aid. A petite woman with nothing but her own guts to call on. She would have to defend herself. <clears throat> Sir, I am Berta Hinojosa. I am the wife of Dr. Raul Hinojosa. My husband was invited by the president of the University of Chicago. And if you don't believe me, you can call him yourself, sir. I often imagined that moment when my mom's inner voice of maternal strength and anguish came shooting up from within her in the form of an anaconda that wrapped itself around the immigrant agent's biceps and started squeezing out for blood, coming in for the kill like a mother tiger protecting her cubs. Under no circumstances will I allow you to keep my child behind. And our paperwork is all in order, sir. And I know that we have the right to come into this country, sir. And in that moment, the sexy, dainty mom in kitten heels transformed into a monster twice the size 
of that immigration agent. With a powerful voice, she yelled up at a man who looked like a tree and said firmly in her thick, unmistakably Mexican accent, I am coming into this country with all four of my children, sir. Do you hear me? You cannot keep my child, sir. Do you hear me, sir? The agent shrank away from the verbal assault, suddenly looking very small. Berta had never wielded this tone before. After her impassioned speech, when the fear and anger had been released and the adrenaline drained away, her body began to shake all over, her little ankles knocking against each other. She realized her own voice, strong, assertive, fearless, had made this man, tall like a duck, tall like a Chapultepec tree, shrink down to a shrub. The man was stunned. No one had spoken to him like this before. Why, why, yes, ma'am. Y- yes, ma'am, he said, not quite knowing what else to do. I imagine he thought my beautiful mother would be quiet and compliant. How many others had been? I couldn't have been the first to have been scrutinized and deemed too dangerous to enter the country. Was there a secret nursery in the Dallas airport in 1962 where they kept all of the diseased and unworthy children? My mom had stood up to him, though, and because of her, I wasn't taken and held with other quarantined children who were scared numb. It had to have been a mistake. That's what I told myself my entire life. But I was wrong. In fact, there was a room for babies like me, and I would discover that as I was writing this book. It wasn't just a room. It was an entire system, decades in the making. You're hearing Maria Hinaosa here on Where We Live, again, reading from her memoir, Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. You, uh, in your reporting career, Maria, you covered uh, these detention facilities, these private prisons to hold people who were undocumented uh, under the Trump administration. So many Americans horrified when children were taken away from their parents. Uh, Just this recently, just in the last week or so, there was this terrible story out of Georgia, one of these detention facilities, uh, allegations from a whistleblower complaint that a doctor had been performing unwanted hysterectomies on women detained there. When you think about all the reporting that you have done, what you have seen, and now this latest story out of Georgia, what comes to your mind? Of course, I'm horrified, but I'm, I'm completely not surprised. The things I'm going to say right now, I want to warn the audience, are going to sound very shocking, but, but they are true. The things that I'm going to say, actually, I cannot prove, but given all of the reporting, this is part of, of this plan. If you are... A criminal, if you have a criminal mind, if you are a sexual abuser, a pedophile, or a sadist, and a torturer, a psychological torturer, you know exactly where to go to find work. You will go and get a job at an immigrant detention facility where you barely have to show a high school diploma. What background checks? Do immigrants deserve people uh, taking care of them who have background checks? Why? Immigrants are called illegal people. They are called animals by this president. And so they don't deserve anything. Now, if you are a baby or a toddler, how do you speak about rape? We know that there are children who are being held in cages. What We know that women, I have been reporting about women being sexually assaulted, raped, Men being beaten, uh, you know, off off the camera angles. People being fed food with maggots. People being over-medicated. We reported about this. I've been screaming. I've been sounding this alarm since I mean, the front line came out in 2011. I mean, I've known the detention facilities. Basically, they ramped up starting in 2003 under George W. Bush. We've been talking about this. There have been, people have died inside. So that that you have a maniacal doctor performing unwanted hysterectomies on, on our bodies, 
the, the difference being the only difference between someone out there and me, because I could end up in one of these places, by the way, because the only the only way you end up there is because you were not born in this country. That's how you end up there. Mm. Please do not be under the illusion that, oh, it's just the criminals. Oh, it's just those. Cri-. No, this place is filled with your neighbors. You have neighbors who have disappeared. The, 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 they're, they're being held in these places. Their children. Uh, these places are filled with refugees, people who are, are you know, fleeing the, the equivalent of, of a world war in their experience. That's the terror that they're fleeing. These places are not filled with criminals. And yet we are being taken care of by criminals mm. over and over and over again. They are audited and they get a thumbs up because they're audited by themselves. They're audited by ICE. They're audited by the government that contracts them. It's a, it's a corrupt system. So, so that, no, of course am I, no, of course I'm not surprised. I know right now a woman is being sexually assaulted in a detention facility someplace. And I know a child is more than likely being psychologically, if not physically tortured at some point right now. Do I have the paper? Uh, can, how do we prove that? Well, we can't because we're not let in. Mm-hmm. As journalists, these places are run by private companies that are making a profit off of every body that is being held there. So wrap your head around that. And many of your companies and your universities and your investment stocks are tied up to private prisons that are making money off of, and they exist in Connecticut, by the way. Mm-hmm. Don't be surprised. They exist there. We need to take a quick break. Again, my guest today, Maria Inahosa, who wrote her memoir, Once I Was You. It just came out this month, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. We'll continue talking with her after the break. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today on Zoom, Maria Inahosa, journalist and founder of Futura Media. She's host of NPR's Latino USA, and she's written a memoir, Once I Was You. We're talking about this book with her today. I wanted to pick up where we left off, Maria, because when we hear about your reporting, we hear so many facts, even though, as you mentioned, a lot of um, journalists can't get into these facilities uh, to find out what's happening to these undocumented immigrants. Again, a whistleblower complaint out of Georgia is how we're hearing about these allegations against a doctor performing unwanted hysterectomies. What do you want Americans to think about as we head into this election? And when we talk about this broken immigration system, this didn't happen overnight. You've been reporting on it for decades. Uh, you talk in this book about um, under Bill Clinton, uh, some of the wall going up or the fact that that frontline documentary you reported on was under the Obama administration when there were abuses against the undocumented. So what do you want Americans when they read your book to understand about what role they have to play in all of this? So it's interesting, Lucy, because I want to make it clear that the people who are in these detention facilities, not all of them are undocumented. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. You you know, again, you would be surprised, but please don't be surprised because I've been saying this for over a decade now. Um, But there are many people who are being held in these detention facilities who have green cards. Um, Okay, in Connecticut, in Connecticut, marijuana is legal in Connecticut. If an undocumented, well, uh, medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. So if an undocumented immigrant is caught smoking a joint um, on the streets of Hartford, that undocumented immigrant for smoking a joint, which basically is now medically legal, he would be picked up um, and processed for deportation. But if if you're a green card holder and you're smoking a joint on the street, and you're picked up by the police, you too can be taken straight into a detention facility. I hope people understand that. The whole notion of painting immigrants like some kind of a threat is part of the narrative. And and that's exactly right, Lucy. What we're doing with this book is to try to deconstruct the narrative 
And the narrative that paints immigrants as some kind of a threat is is more powerful, I think, than the narrative of the Statue of Liberty, frankly. It, it is more consistent. And, and, it, and it, in, it affects us and infects us. I was writing this section, I'm going to be very honest with well, because I'm, I'm honest, that's how I do things. So, um, and I like to reveal that we all have faults, right? I was writing a section of the history book about um, the, the exclusion, the Chinese Exclusion Act which actually begins with the exclusion of Asian women before the Chinese Exclusion Act, ex excluding Asian women. And I wrote something that I had heard, right? Oh, because they were prostitutes and <gasps> what? No, 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 no. My editor was like, no, who is uh, Katie Salisbury, who is um, half Asian, said, no, 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 what, what is, and it was like, holy, whoa, they, this is what they labeled. No, those women were coming to be reunited with their husbands who were working building the railroad. But the very first people excluded by law were Chinese Asian women. That could have been my mother too. So I want everybody to realize that you have a responsibility now, this moment of understanding our responsibility in tearing down disrespect for black lives is the moment when we are also tearing down this anti-immigrant reality, which is built on anti-indigenous hate, anti-black hate, anti-immigrant hate, right? It's all tied. The immigrants, and by the way, especially in Connecticut, please do not, you know, immigrants are from everywhere. We are from Africa. We are from the Middle East. We are from Pakistan. We are from Ireland and Canada. So your Irish neighbor may be undocumented. How do you know? You don't know. That's what I'm trying to say is that I hope that this book touches your heart. Raul Castillo, the actor who was the first reader of the book, said, oh, my God, I, f I feel like I'm armed with information. And I really was not expecting that. But that was like, yes. OK, you know something about my personal life. But yes, now you're armed with information. That's what I hope. And, and that people not just are armed, but then and I mean that, you know, I'm a peaceful person. But I seem, you know, that you have you have the boxing gloves to be able to have that argument and then defend your country in the sense that we can, we got to do better than this. Mm. Maria, there's so much in your book that we didn't get to. I really wanted to talk with you about... I'll come back. <laughs> I don't live far. <laughs> I'd love it. I really wanted to talk with you about how candid you were about the trauma that you experienced. Again, you're a rape survivor, but also as a journalist covering stories uh, after 9-11, seeing what you did see in these detention facilities. Uh, but hopefully this intrigues people to pick up the book. It's well worth your time. Maria Inahosa, thank you so much for joining us here on Where We Live. Thank you so much, Lucy. I love your show. I love you. I love Connecticut. I'm kind of gushing. It's nice to start a Monday morning with a lot of happy feelings because we did talk about a lot of serious mm -hmm. stuff. And I, I do hope people fall in love with this book and let me know. Tweet at me. Shoot me an Instagram. Oh, the dog's about to bark. <laughs> um, but yes, that's what it is. I love being in touch with you all. And I really hope it connects with you. And thank you so much for this beautiful interview. Thank you, Maria. Again, Once I Was You, you can read an excerpt on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.